Welcome to Let's Talk Death, conversations to inform and inspire. Let's Talk Death is a series of conversations with some amazing people from various fields. Our goal through these conversations is to normalize, educate, and demystify the taboo around death, dying, and the journey of grief. Hello, welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Death. I'm Fran Solomon, and I'm thrilled to be your host for this conversation. Let's Talk Death is brought to you by Heal Grief, a social support network creating community after someone has died. Everything we do is inspired by our core belief that no one should ever grieve alone. Our goal with this program is to have a friendly conversation with some amazing people in the field so we can help normalize and educate our Heal Grief community. Our guest today is Amanda Davis. After losing her father at the age of 12, Amanda turned to art and writing as an outlet. It became her voice, a way to cope, a way to escape, and a way to tell her story. She was thus inspired to teach art and pursue her passion for writing and illustrating children's book. Today, Amanda is a teacher, writer, artist, and writer, and innovator who uses her words and pictures to light up the world with kindness. Through her work, Amanda empowers younger generations to tell their stories and offers children and adults an entry into a world of discovery, a world that can help make help them make sense of themselves, others, and the community around them. Amanda is the author of the award-winning picture book, 30,000 Stitches, an inspiring story of the national 9-11 flag. She is a recipient of the Ann Whitford Paul Writer's Digest Most Promising Picture Book Manuscript Grant. And when she's not busy creating, you can find her sipping tea, petting dogs, and exploring the natural wonders of the Bay State with her family and her rescue pup. Amanda, I'm delighted to have you on our show. Thank you so much, Fran. I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit more about who I am and what I do and how that kind of overlaps with the mission of Heal Grief. Yeah, amazing. And I hope I didn't miss anything in your resume. <laughs> no, great job. <laughs> I, I, I have to say they are read. They're not, they're, they're not memorized. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. That would I be very hard that. to memorize all that. <laughs> so Amanda, before we get into your work, um, may I first take you back in time and ask you to share what life was like after you learned about your father's death? Sure. Yes. So as you mentioned in my bio, my dad passed away suddenly um, when I was 12 years old. So it was unexpected. Um, and at that age, I didn't really know how to process things. I don't remember many people speaking to me about what happened um, or provi providing me with a lot of resources to help me get through it. Um, and I just sort of kept going. And that was all I, that's kind of how I remember it. I, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but that's how I remember it. I just remember I was, you know, I was in sixth grade and I went back to school and it kind of just felt like um, every day. And then it wasn't until I was in high school that I feel like things started to kind of really hit me. And, um, you know, I, I developed some anxieties and, and just, I think that all of that processing was delayed and it, it came on later in life. Um, so yeah, you know, right after it happened, um, I really don't remember having maybe that support that I needed besides my immediate family. But you know, when there's only one parent or caregiver left too, they are trying to process and grieve themselves. So it was my sister and I and my mom um, that were surviving and it's a lot for the for the person who was left trying to carry on as the adult and bring up the children. So, you know, I think my mom was going through her own things and doing the best she can or she could. Um, and so I think it was also stigmatized, you know, she might've been embarrassed to talk about it. And like you were saying, as your mission with heal grief is normalizing death, being able to talk about it. And that's really what inspired me to, um, do the work that I'm doing today, uh, both as an educator and as a children's book author illustrator is to hopefully fill in those gaps where I felt like we're lacking when I was younger to just provide um, kids and adults a space to 
talk about these things, talk about grief, talk about loss and have that support and community that you mentioned is so important to have after an event like that. Yeah, you know what? So often um, we hear stories, especially uh, today when um, adults had a parent die or a significant person die in their life from so many years ago, the old belief was don't talk about it, it'll go away. Mm -hmm. Or let's just not skip a beat and time will heal and, and we'll forget. Well, I'm sure like you, I know that I didn't forget that my father died or that my mother died or, you know, um, the, the list of people in my life were once present and no longer with us. And, and so, you know, it, many were brought up then really to just not talk about it, not mention it, you know, just get into that routine. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that changing at all? I mean, in addition to the work to, that you do, do you, do you feel do. that that's changing? I do. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like there's at least, um, you know, me, I'm sure there were organizations out there that were providing support to children during that time. It was 1997, but it, like you said, I don't think it was really talked about as much within the families or maybe just um, resources weren't given out as much. So I, I feel like, yeah, people are talking about it more, especially even young adolescents. You know, I think that um, it's a lot of difficult things that have happened in our world and it's really kind of in our faces. So I think that um, for the world we're living in now, I'm happy that we are talking about it a bit more because death and loss and grief are always going to be a part of life. Um, and no matter how old we are or what year we're living in, um, so yeah, I do. I do feel like there's many more picture books on the topics that you can turn to. Um, I remember when I was looking um, at some of the other years where picture books were coming out, like there, there weren't that many. So um, on death and grieving and loss, and now there are just a, a lot of wonderful picture books. So books are another resource to turn to. So yes, I do. I do think that, um, you know, there's more resources, there's more community organizations that are talking about it. And even just in the mental health field, I think that it's something that is um, being spoken about more and, and talked about. So when did you realize you were starting to use art to express yourself? Not until I was older, um, actually. So, I mean, I was doing it after my father passed away. I turned to writing. I loved poetry. So I was writing poems. I was drawing. Um, and it was really an escape for me. And it was something that was a way to kind of just process and also get away, kind of a little escape. So at the time, I was only 12. I don't think I was recognizing it as a tool to help me process. But when I look back, that was definitely something that I turned to. Um, and I didn't have to say anything. You know, I could write and, and I didn't have to talk about it or I could draw and I didn't have to talk about it. And people weren't asking me about it anyway. So that was, <laughs> that was kind of my way of letting it out and just expressing it. Um, and that's what I continue to do. So art and writing continue to bring me comfort and help me process things, experiences in my life and whether it's difficult or joyous as well. So it, tell me about um, 30,000 Stitches, the inspiring story of the national 9-11 flag. Yes. So that is the true story of the American flag that was hung up over ground zero days after 9-11 and it became very torn, tattered, and it eventually was taken down, stored away, and then um, brought back out on this historical journey across all 50 states to be restored. So again, it's another book that's really about overcoming tragedy through unity, through healing, through community. And my first um, three books are all about that, really. Um, so clearly that's something that <laughs> is dear to my heart is just being able to um, recognize these difficult things in our life and be able to come together, talk about it and persevere. Um, and that story has a lot of grief and loss in it as well. Um, the flag, yeah, went around to each of the states and patches from each state. Um, they had American flags that were retired from various things. For example, um, the Fort Hood uh, shooting, um, various other tragedies too throughout the United States. They were taking pieces of those flags. So the flag that flew over um, Fort Hood and then was stitched into the New York flag. So the flag itself is really a symbol of 
of healing and yeah, overcoming, whether it's, you know, loss through tragedy or whatever. Um, so that was a very special book to write. It was a very special book to have be my first book as a children's book author. Um, I got to speak with a lot of the people who were involved in the real life story who are still on their journey, you know, to heal 20, 21 years later. Um, so recognizing too, that this journey of healing isn't linear. It's something that continues. Um, and that's what I've recognized throughout my life too, as it's shown up in, in different ways. Yeah, I always say that, um, just because our person isn't here in physical presence, that doesn't mean they've been erased from our mind and our heart. You know, they're, they're still with us for the rest of our life mm -hmm. and they die, um, two deaths. The first is, um, their physical death. And the next step is when we stop talking about them mm. and we stop remembering them, mm -hmm. um, you know, sharing, sharing them, um, I think is really an important part, keeping in mind that they're still very present with us mm -hmm. is, I think is so important to our continued journey of healing and acceptance. And, and it's, it's really the acceptance that they're not with us physically, but how do we actively move forward you know, and keep them with us. Yes. That's how I like to say it. I, I completely agree. And I think that that's a really beautiful way of looking at it. Um, and when, when I think about that, I think about, I carry this, this locket with me. It says, um, I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. It's a little excerpt from a E.E. E. Cummings poem and my dad's picture is in it. And I like to have something tangible that I can really carry with me. The chain broke on this locket right now, so that's why it's not on the chain, but I've carried this with me um, to all the momentous times in my life. It was on my bouquet as I walked down the aisle. My mom walked me down, but my dad was right there on my bouquet. We brought it to a little photo shoot that we did when I was pregnant. And then um, when I had my daughter, which she's 16 months now, um, we did another little photo shoot and she had it in her hand. So she was able to be there right with Grampy and I feel like for me, having this, you know, tangible item that I can actually carry with me, have close to my heart has just made me feel like even though I'm having these, you know, landmark moments happen, um, he's right there with me. So that's something that I like to, to do to feel like, you know, his memory is living on. In addition to writing stories where I can also talk about, you know, grief and loss and how, how we can still always remember our loved ones. What I love about that is that you're now introducing your daughter to him mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and making him very much a, a part of her world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is really amazing. Yes. Tell even us about Moon. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, even though she won't get to meet her grampy in the physical form, we will, like you said, continue to talk about him, show him pictures, show her pictures of him um, and tell stories. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Tell us about Moonlight Memories. So Moonlight Memories is directly inspired by the story of losing my dad when I was young. And it tells the story of a young girl named Piper who has lost her mother um, and is now using um, art and writing as a way to, and here's the cover, um, as a way to heal and process. Um, so she's looking to the sky and she is seeing memories of her mother and then she's capturing those through her drawings, um, realizing that her mama will always live on through her art and in her heart. So this idea that if we um, have those memories with us, we can remember them always, we'll carry them with us always. Will you read a page? Of course, yes. Let's see, ooh, what page? I'll read one of my favorite ones, which is towards the end, so maybe I'm giving a little away here. It comes out in June. So yeah, this does kind of give it away, but this is my, one of my favorite pages where all of her drawings are swirling around and it says, moonlight memories filled her room, colorful lines of laughter, textured drops of tears, soft strokes of stories, mama's love filled her heart, and comfort filled her arms. So she's with her dad there. And also as a part of it, it does show that dad is hurting too. Um, and that is touched upon in the book as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And I believe you have a soon to be named next book. Yes. So I'm not, it hasn't been officially announced yet, so I can't share too much, but it's another nonfiction one, similar to my first 30,000 stitches, but this one is about, um, human loss, but the animal bond, um, and memory again, too. So it has this, I love animals as well. And this was an amazing true story. Um, so it has that animal human connection, also the idea of memory and remembrance and, and healing. You know, it's interesting you're, you're bringing in animals. Usually uh, the death of a pet is a child's first introduction to um, grief. Mm -hmm. And um, so often I think we as adults miss that opportunity to make it a real teaching moment of, um, of what life and death is and how to grieve or how to be able to process grief. You know, for so many, it's like, oh, well, we'll just go out and get another dog or we'll just mm -hmm. go out and get another cat. Well, when you think about that, and that, that can't be translated to, well, we'll just get you another father, or right. we'll just get you another mother, mm -hmm. you know, but, but yet we're teaching that almost in many of the ways that we're still doing things when we don't take that time to um, address and guide a child through the significance of death and the importance of grieving. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes it's more our discomfort, right? That makes us, that's the obstacle, whether it's not knowing how to talk about it, fear that it might make it worse. Um, so yeah, I agree that that first loss with a pet possibly, you know, could be a, a great first, first entry point to have the discussion. Um, there's also some great picture books on that topic. Um, the Rough Patch is one it's, um, by Brian Lees. There's several. So if a parent is, you know, struggling with that with a pet, again, books are just great to turn to. You know, if you don't know how to dive into that topic, maybe read the book and then ask a couple of questions. And that could be a great entryway and lead into a discussion on it. Yeah. So as a teacher, have you come across... Um, students that have presented themselves as newly bereaved mm -hmm. yep and Definitely. i mean i'm sure you have boundaries um that that you have to be guided by but um how, how do you how do you approach that child i always address it i think you know coming from my own experience where i don't remember a lot of people or teachers talking to me about it i make sure that i ask them how they're doing I think even just simple, something as simple as that. Um, how are you doing? How is your family doing? Um, and then I usually give them a card. I taught high school. So I taught high school for 12 years. Um, and I usually give them a card and I share um, not equating my experience to their experience by any means. Um, but I do share that I lost my father when I was young. And then I usually share a little quote for them because, again, I love words <laughs> to help us process. <laughs> um, and... Yeah. And then I attend any, you know, services that they might have to just show them I'm here and I care and I want to support you. So if you want to talk about it, um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. And that's amazing because again, so many adults um, stay so removed mm -hmm. because they're not sure what kind of emotions they're going to evoke, not only in the child or the person, but in themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how many times do we hear you know, I, I just, I feel so all alone. I feel like mm -hmm. nobody understands because nobody is having the conversation with mm -hmm. the person that's grieving, not, mm -hmm. you know, keeping in mind that, that grief is something, it, it's not that we're grieving every day, but grief is a lifelong journey. And, you know, a year later to, to just say, Hey, you know, I, I just want you to know, I remember, you know, might evoke tears. Yep. Um, it just might, but I, I think for many, it would be tears of my goodness, my person was remembered mm -hmm. as opposed to tears. How can you remind me that my person's not here? 
<laughs> and I'm sure they're thinking about it anyway. You know, that's the thing, especially if it's a day, an anniversary that they passed away or that person's already thinking about it. You know, you're not going to make it any worse by sharing your condolences or a word of encouragement or whatever it is. And I think for me, when I was younger, saying nothing made it worse because that translated to me that I don't care. And that was just me as a child interpreting it because I'm sure that wasn't the case, but you know, by not saying anything, it could be misinterpreted as well. Um, and what, what do you look back and say, if only we knew this, I wish this would have been done differently. What, what is it that would have been done differently? Um, Hmm. That's a really great question, Fran. I feel like I would have liked to have talked to a talked to a counselor um, earlier on in life. Like if someone had given me that resource or shared that resource with me, I feel like things later on in life may have been a little bit. I don't. Yeah, maybe easier. Um, so, I suppose to answer that question, yeah, if someone had said to me, listen, I think that you should maybe speak with so-and-so about the experience, or at least try that, um, you know, shortly after it happened. I think that could have been really helpful. Um, and I know in my art room too, I try to do projects that have to do, that give students the opportunity to um, express things going on in their life or parts of their identity. So if I were given more spaces to do that, perhaps, um, where I could share that part of my story, um, I think that could have been very helpful. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And um, I, I not only agree with both, but I also have the experience of many that we serve who are adults that hit a brick wall all of a sudden, a trigger or a life cycle, and they're not sure where their grief is coming from. Mm -hmm. But if you take the time to dive into it, you know, and usually that's especially at that point with the help of a professional, it all comes back to this unresolved grief that that where they weren't given an opportunity to, to process it. Mm -hmm. So I think that happened to me, actually, you know, um, I've struggled postpartum and I think becoming a parent myself brought out you know, another big um, shift in my life. And I, I think that, like you just said, parts of me that maybe had not fully processed the loss of a parent and then becoming a parent um, was a really interesting shift for me and uh, made it really challenging, I think. Um, we also moved. So even like the loss of a house, just like, and that was all at once. So, you know, just this idea of loss, <laughs> whatever stage it is or whatever it looks like for, for different aspects of your life, whether it is moving from a place that was special to you or becoming a parent and losing your previous identity. Or I think I, I've struggled a lot more than I anticipated with that too. And I, I, I believe that part of it is in connection to that. Yeah, interesting to say that. When my father died, I did I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I grieved through the weekend, and then I got myself ready for work on Sunday, and I just persevered. I was mm -hmm. strong. I was all those cliches. And then um, fast forward several years later, my daughter was born. This this little thing that I wanted, I I I just I wanted her so badly. And then when she was born, I was so sad. Mm -hmm. And I was really fortunate that I had a friend at the time sit with me and like, Fran, what's up? And I went through all the lists of why I was so sad and I'm not sleeping and this and that. And then all of a sudden, boom, the last thing that came out and my father wasn't here to see the one thing he wanted more than anything mm -hmm. in the world, a granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And and that was really, um, I, I want to say almost the beginning of my healing journey because I mm -hmm. had pushed it down so far thinking that's what I'm supposed to do because I'm going to move on um, that if if I didn't have that opportunity and that epiphany I may have actually displaced my grief and had been very angry with my daughter mm. 
you know, because she brought me this sadness when in fact she didn't. She brought me this joy. Mm -hmm. I was saddened that my father wasn't there to experience it with me and to, to see her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having children brings up a lot of or uncovers a lot of things that we didn't necessarily know were there. <laughs> But in, in a way where we can, it opens us up to heal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Amanda, people want to get, um, want to see your work or, or get to know you. Do you have a website? Do you have, tell me, tell me where our audience might be able to connect with you. I do. Yes. So my website is um, www.amandadavisart.com. And you can connect with me there. My email is actually on there if anyone wants to reach out or have questions um and then the publisher's website you can also go there i think they're going to post a blog where I, I actually mentioned heal grief as a resource because i found your work to be yeah very inspiring and helpful and i would love for anyone who's um you know readers of the book to be aware of um, your community and resources as well Thank so that's you. on their website which is worthykids.com Amazing. Amazing. So Amanda, we want to thank you for being a guest here on Let's Talk Death and for sharing your story and the inspiration behind your book. Um, and we want to thank those uh, joining us for this episode of Let's Talk Death. If you would like to learn more about Heal Grief, please visit us at healgrief.org. At healgrief.org, you can learn more about all of our programs and resources of Heal Grief, including our national network, of support for grieving young adults called Actively Moving Forward. And if you know of a bereaved adult, refer them to our AMF app, where adults of all ages connect with others experiencing a similar death loss. And last, make sure to sign up on healgrief.org to receive our newsletter for links to future episodes of Let's Talk Death. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time on Let's Talk Death.